Good morning, LVC. For those of you who don't know me, I'm, my name is Daniel Oko. I'm a congregant as well as being part of the preaching team. I will begin us today by reading the scripture from which I will share from, which is First Chronicles chapter 16, from verse 1 to 36. So if you can get your Bible, you can read, you can be, you can follow me as I read. They brought the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And they presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before God. After David had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each Israelite man and woman. He appointed some of the Lev Levites to minister before the ark of the, of the Lord to extol, thank, and praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the, was the chief, and next to him in rank was Zechariah, then Jaziel, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Matithai, Eliab, Benaiah, Obed-Edom, Obed and Jael. They were to play the liars, the lies, forgive me if I've pronounced that long, <laughs> wrongly, and harps. Asaph was to sound the cymbals, and Benaiah and Jahaziel, the priest, were to blow the trumpets regularly before the ark of the covenant of God. That day, David first appointed Asaph and his associates to give praise to the Lord in this manner. Give praise to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his, in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength and, and his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles and the judgments he pronounced. You, his servants, the de descendants of Israel, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath he swore to Isaac, he confirmed it to Jacob as a decree, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. To you I will give the land of Canaan as the portion you will inherit. When there were but a few in number, few indeed and strangers in it, they wandered from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another. He allowed no one to oppress them. For their sake he rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do, not, do my prophets no harm. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous deeds among all people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and, let, and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out, save us, God, 
our Savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Um, a long prayer, a sung prayer, but a beautiful example of corporate prayer. So, today I want, I'm hoping to challenge us to do one thing. To prioritize corporate prayer for the health of our own private prayer lives. I'll say it again, to prioritize corporate prayer for the health of our own prayer lives. Well, starting, I think, mid last year, my, my last born son, um, he got a, a rather high fever, so I checked his tonsils and they, were, they seemed swollen, so we rushed him to hospital. After being reviewed, he was found to have acute tonsillitis, so a prescription was given and we were back home taking him through the dosage, hoping it will clear up soon. Um, but it did not. Then began months of just trudging to hospital um, every few weeks. The, the prescriptions were changing, um, but the tonsillitis was proving itself stubborn. And on his second admission, the doctors decided it was time for a tonsillectomy. Basically, as I look back to that time, it was like three months of prescriptions, but no cure. And our little boy, um, being so unwell and lethargic and in discomfort and pain, was hard for my wife and I. Because not only were the prescriptions not working, it seemed also our efforts at prayer um, weren't either. Personally, by the second month, I, I was struggling to pray, um, wondering if prayer actually made a difference to my son's plight. Um, but the thing is, for most of us, for me included, we, we take prayer as a prescription. Um, it ought to cure or bring to an end something that is troubling in our lives. I've got a crisis, so I need to pray. Um, well, there's nothing wrong in that view. It is right and true for us to turn to God with our troubles. Philippians 4, uh, verse 6 to 8 tells us if we are anxious about anything, um, to present those anxieties to God. What is wrong is when this becomes the only way we understand prayer to be. If you were to view prayer in totality, it's more akin to breathing than to it being a prescription. For those of us who call Jesus Lord and Savior, prayer should just be that, breathing. It shows our utter dependence on God and the primacy of an intimate, uh, and the primacy of an intimate communion with him. But the problem is, this is usually not the case, right? Um, prayer usually ends up being the solution to our crisis. And can be categorized together with, you know, um, a first aid box, calling 911 or 999 when there's an emergency. And when the crisis abates, so does our prayer. Or when the crisis is protracted, um, so does our fervency and motivation to pray. Well, we need prayer to be once more like breathing and not like a prescription. But how do we go about getting there? Um, what means of grace are available to us as believers to rekindle and refresh our prayer lives? Well, there are many ways, huh? but today I want to speak of one peculiar way, yet still potent and true, by regular participation in corporate prayer. 
I'll repeat that, by regular participation in corporate prayer. And for those of us who are in LVC, by regular participation in what? In LVC corporate prayer. It is true that a vibrant personal prayer life um, will enrich corporate prayer, but it, is, but it is also true that participating in corporate prayer is a means of grace available to me and to you to rekindle and refresh our own private prayer lives. But, but before I get to, to that, I want, to, uh, I want first to debunk a few myths about corporate prayer. One is that corporate prayer is for an elite league of, of Christians, yeah? the, the ones who are called prayer warriors. Yeah? You know those who can pray for hours, um, know the right thing to say in the right tone, and they come out of you know, those hours of prayer looking like they came out of a spa. Well, that is not true. Corporate prayer is for all believers. It's for the gathered church, right? The second myth is, if I attend a corporate prayer session, I must pray. Um, well, no. For example, in our passage today, the corporate prayer is led by David and the, the Levitical priesthood. So you don't need to. If opportunity does arise and you feel led to pray, then please go ahead and pray. Otherwise, you can agree silently. So before you pop the champagne and say, man, hey, uh, uh, what I'm suggesting is not that corporate prayer is a silver bullet to solve all your, your, your prayer issues. But I want to argue today that avoiding to participate in corporate prayer is avoiding a means of grace available to you to enrich and rekindle your own prayer life. So is corporate prayer a means of grace, right? That's, uh, I think that's the question we should, which is running probably in your head. Um, well, it is interesting that most prayers in the Bible are corporate prayers. And here, just don't have in view the Old Testament, even the New Testament. In fact, uh, those who've done the math actually say 90% of the prayers mentioned in the New Testament are corporate. So there's something here, right? So today, as we look at David's sung corporate prayer, I want us to see how corporate prayer, prayer can be a means of grace to us. Well, chapter 16 of, of First Chronicles invites, uh, invites us to one excited king who wants to spread the joy around, man. He's just, he's a happy man. King David has experienced the faithfulness of God, the God who called him as a teenager. And at that time, his future seemed confined to sheep and food deliveries. And God had promised that he would be king. And after many ups and downs, God kept his promise. David is king and he's amazed at God, our God, and he wants everyone to declare God's greatness, God's goodness, God's faithfulness, God's loving kindness. I'll focus on three gems, right, on, in this corporate prayer that are not only, are not only essential elements to corporate prayer, but are also keys to revitalizing our own prayer lives. The first gem is this, corporate prayer reminds us of God's sovereignty. I repeat that, corporate prayer reminds us of who? Of what? Of God's sovereignty. By sovereignty here we mean the one who holds ultimate and supreme power and authority. And where do I see this? Uh, it is seen through God's judgments. As for example, let's read uh, verse 14. There we are told, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are, all, are in all the earth. This basically means that in all places and at all times, God is ultimately in control. We live in a time of, of rising nationalism, nationalism um, across the globe, right? Um, Jeremy shared last week um, the sad happenings in the U.S., um, and the reality is that the whole world was watching because of what and who the United States are. They are the only superpower nation, right? They are the first amongst the nations. 
And so what happens there reverberates across the world. Because you see, nations epitomize sovereignty, power, authority. But in these verses and in numerous places in the Bible, we are reminded that God is ultimately the one who brings up and who brings, brings down nations. The prophet Isaiah will say the nations are but a drop in the bucket before our God. And we need this truth, truth to sink deeply in our hearts that the one who holds us holds the nations. The symbols of our sovereign power are held by our sovereign God. And his purpose is not um, and his purposes shall prevail even over our nations. In verse 33, we also read, Let the trees of the forest sing, and let them sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Church, not only are, the, are God's judgments over the earth currently, but ultimately he will judge all injustice across all time. Here we are reminded no one gets away. No one gets away. Whether it happened in the dark, in closed rooms, in secret meetings, in lonely places, in high places, in our courts, in our schools, no one gets away. And in light of this truth, we are told to rejoice because God will judge the earth. Well, as I read on, verse 29 also tells us, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Then verse 25 says, For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. I don't know what takes your breath away. Uh, what, what leaves you breathless? Um, what gives you those wow moments? Um, for me, I experience that when I, I, I've stood before the ocean or when I'm around Nanyuki or Nyeri and I see Mount Kenya early morning in its grandeur. Our God is the creator of whatever takes our breath away. Our God is without equal and without anyone or anything above him. There's a lot in the world to give us anxiety and fear and to overwhelm us and to make us want to join classical atheists like Nietzsche who believed in existential nihilism, which basically means nothing matters, nothing is of real value. But corporate prayer reminds us that we have an almighty God. We have a God who is holy in nature and is also perfect in his moral attributes. We have a God of such beauty that we cannot even use the phrase he takes our breath away because the Bible testifies that we need to be transformed, given a new body to behold him. As we are, if we meet him, if we beheld our God, we will cease to breathe entirely. And this perfect God is the one who gives us value, who creates us in his own image. In light of God's sovereignty, when you read the Psalms of David, let me just throw a few lines to you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. David is not making empty declarations. He's not, he's not, you know, a guy practicing positive thinking. He's someone who knows his God. He knows in whom he has believed. Do we? Do I? The only sovereign God over all creation, all time, all events, and even the course of history do you know this sovereign Lord who is sovereign over your fear, 
over your sins, over your failures, over your sickness, over your oppressors, over your sense of being overwhelmed, do you know him? Sovereignty tells us God is transcendent. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, and ultimately his purpose will prevail over all things. But I guess the question now which comes to mind is, how does this affect me? How does this affect you? How do I know I'm not just a, 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 a piece on the chessboard of God, just being moved around for his own pleasure? Does he know me? Does he know you? Does he see me? Does he, does he know my tears, my struggles, my depression, my emptiness? The emptiness? Does he know, does he care? And that leads me to my second gem. Corporate prayer rejoices in God's covenant faithfulness. In verse 15 to 17, we read that God remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant. And by covenant, we mean a serious promise uh, made between two parties to fulfill some certain action. A good example is marriage, right? Um, the wedding ceremony, vows are given um, before a, a, a pastor and where a man and woman promise to exclusively and faithfully uh, love one another before God and before witnesses. So David reminds the people of the covenant-keeping God, the God of Abraham, that he is faithful and that he has fulfilled his promise to Abraham and that he will be faithful to sustain them. Those of us who call Jesus Lord and Savior, we are even under a better covenant with the same God, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Our Lord tells us none can take us out of his hand. Our Lord says we are we are his children by ad adoption. Our Lord says he has paid the price for our sin. Our Lord tells us all our tears will be wiped away. And even death, even death itself, won't be the fat lady that sings the last dirge over us. We are held by faithful hands, not because we ourselves are faithful. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Verse 13, Paul will say, when we, we are faithless, God remains faithful because he cannot be untrue to himself. So church, we are held by faithful hands. Verse 34 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. We are being reminded that we are held by loving hands. Basically, if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, I would have you watch our, our videos for our, our young kids, our Sunday school videos, where they use the Jesus Storybook Bible. And there, the, the definition of, uh, I want to quote their definition of love from the JSB Bible. It is, we, we are loved with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. That is the love of God, guys. Never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. And the funny thing is not because of our looks or our intelligence or our morality. It's just because the sovereign Lord has chosen to. Listen to the reason God gives for loving Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7. It was not because you are more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you are the fewest of all peoples. But, here comes the reason. It is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. 
Do you hear the reason given for loving Israel? Because I loved Israel and because I am faithful. The reason for loving Israel is because I loved Israel and because I am faithful. There's nothing in the people that merited his love for them. Church, God's love for the Christian is merit-free, criteria-free, moral weighing scale-free, race-free, intellect-free, class or caste free, charisma free, color, height, body shape free. It is a gift freely given to those who haven't earned it. Yet at the same time it is so deep, so enduring, and more passionate than any love story written, experienced, or sung by human beings. Let me give you a few examples in the Bible. Think of Hagar's confession in Genesis chapter 16. This is an Egyptian girl, um, a maid servant in Abraham's house. She is kicked out by the woman of the house, Sarah. And she flees to the desert alone, not knowing what to do and where to go. God, appearing as the angel of the Lord, calls her by name. Egyptian girl, meaning she's not a covenant um, um, individual. She is a foreigner. She is called by name by God. And God gently asks her where she is from and where she is going. God listens to her and then God greatly blesses her. And you know what her reflection is? What the Bible writes was, a, was after all these things, what her reflection was are these words. You are the God who sees me. Jehovah El Roy, you are the God who sees me. Church, he sees your tears. Psalm 56 says he actually, he keeps lists of our tears in a scroll. He sees those things in our heart that we can't even explain. We can only feel them. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus meets a leper who, who asks for healing. And we, we, we know that the lepers were the, the lowest of low in terms of the outcasts of society in, in first century Palestine. They were the rejects of society. And Jesus does a peculiar thing. He touches him before he heals him. A totally unnecessary step. I mean, it will make more sense for him to heal him as he observes, you know, social distancing, right? But no, he touches him before he heals him. And, and, and this is just me, you know, my imagination, my, my own thinking. My, I think the Lord touches him. What God touches at that time is this man's rejection. This man's shame, this man's low self-esteem. God doesn't stand afar from that. And such is our God that with our biggest shame, with our darkest memory and secret, uh, with our deepest heart, he doesn't just want to make it go away. He wants to let you know that he understands and knows it as intimately as you do, if not more. Do you know this love that Paul will say we need the Holy Spirit, Spirit's power to comprehend? Do you know it? And I'll even stress, it can't be experienced if Jesus is not the Lord of your life. To you Christians struggling in prayer, when you start feeling less of a Christian, remember God's love for you, that it endures forever, and that it, will, it is freely given and unmerited. So you can't earn it. So don't try and earn it right now. So corporate prayer, therefore, should proclaim two things. That one, that God is the only sovereign. He not only created the world, but holds the world. He will do away with all evil. 
and he will bring about ultimate justice for every wrong committed. Two is that God knows me, that God knows you, that God sees you, that God loves you, that God is faithful to you. Biblical Christianity proclaims the two truths about God that philosophers have struggled to reconcile. Um, and many would actually say in, in view of reality that both can't be true. That God is all-powerful and God is all-loving. And we declare this by the evidence of the scriptures, by the testimony of the saints, and by our own lives. It is only on the foundation of these biblical truths then, confessed and persuaded on, if you are fully persuaded on them, or growing in conviction in them, are we spurred on to the third gem of corporate prayer. Corporate prayer reignites us to seek and rejoice in God at all times. I'll repeat that. Corporate prayer reignites us to seek and rejoice in God at all times. You see, the more we are convinced that God is sovereign, that he loves us with a never-ending, unmerited love, the more we'll understand the biblical insistence on praising God at all times. Consider that in this prayer, the word praise is repeated 16 times. The question is, why so many repetitions of that word, you know, the word praise? So here are a couple of options we have to answer that question. First is, maybe it's because of David, right? You know, David, um, basically he's seen God's faithfulness. He, he, God has come through. He's a king now, man, you know. So he's all happy, happy-go-lucky, man. Uh, so basically, it is very easy to praise God uh, when prayers are answered, right? When, when the, the way you wanted things to go have come to pass. But then, this prayer is not just David's private personal prayer, right? It is corporate prayer for all the people. And I will bet not everyone's life is going as fabulous as David's um, currently in, our, in this time of history. Another option is because it is some form of protocol in prayer, right? You know, like, you know, believers ought to use such words in prayer like praise, thanksgiving, or it should be an element in your prayer life? Well, that seems a bit unlikely because the words rejoicing and praise are scattered all over the prayer. It seems less organized, more spontaneous and uh, organic. The last option, in my view, will be, and which I think is the most viable, is that the praise is so repeated, so scattered all over the prayer because it is said by those who are persuaded that God is sovereign and that God loves them. Again, why do you praise God? Is it only because he has answered your prayer as you wanted? What happens when he doesn't? Do you praise him because it is part of the steps of a good prayer? It is good to praise God when things go okay. It is good to, in our prayer, know that you know we are supposed to give thanks. All these things are good. But from what I've seen in this prayer today, to have a sustained um, life of praising God, um, meaning praising Him in all circumstances, it comes from knowing and being convicted that our God is the just and sovereign Lord who loves us with a never-ending love. Well, also in verse 35 we read, uh, Say also, save us, O God of our salvation, and gather and deliver us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. In corporate prayer, we get to cry to God to save us. Um, we, we get to put forward our petitions to God. And I love the words used there, you know, like the two words, save us. Because they speak of desperation. Um, it paints a picture of not casual request, 
but of desperate appeal. It is a cry of those who are drowning, those who are enslaved, those who are overwhelmed, those who are oppressed, those who are weak, those who are dying, and those who feel dead. Here also, in my view, I find uh, the place for confession of sin. In our passage today, it's not explicitly said, but it is alluded to by the word save us, and the words, O God of our salvation. Basically, whatever sinful habit you are wrestling with, only God is powerful enough to save you from it and transform you to live free from it and is loving enough to forgive you no matter what it is and how many times you've done it. As I wind up, um, another family story. Um, there's a place my family and I have I've gone to a couple of times, right, uh, down the years, um, to for vacation. And there's a pool there. So the pool has a slide on the low, the shallow end side, right? There's like a slide there, you know, you can slide into the pool on the shallow end. Well, initially my boys, when they were younger, they had this mix of curiosity and fear concerning it. They wanted to go up on it, you know, because it looked like a lot of fun, but also, hey, they looked at the water, man. They was, were like, I don't want to drown, you know. So my firstborn son, um, for a number of times, he, he kept climbing up the stairs and then getting to the point of sitting on the slide. But after that, he, he was just, he could not move. He was paralyzed with fear, just looking at that water. He's a, a little guy, he knows if he falls there, he, he, he can't swim yet, he, he just sees himself drinking buckets of water, you know. So my appeals to, to him that I would catch him, because I would stand under that slide and say, okay, I'm here, man, I'll, I'll catch you, just calm down, Baba is here. Uh, he wasn't convinced. Then one day he, he actually started looking at me you know, intensely, he was focused on my face. Um, and he was listening to my words, you know, Baba is here, um, you won't drown, I will catch you, uh, just, just come. Um, and the little boy <laughs> let go and went down the slide. Um, and funny thing, his focus was not on the water, it was on me. Right? And I caught him. You see, when we... We magnify God in prayer, corporate prayer, private prayer. We adore God for who he is and what he has done. We, we are like my little boys, looking into the waters which look so overwhelming. The waters can be our sin, our, the problems we are facing, the, the sense of injustice, to us or in the world. Adoration reminds us to look to the one who stands in the waters, who can stand in those waters, who can stand over those waters, who can stand on those waters, our sovereign God. But even if the troubles don't go away, right, we know that he will hold us that he will sustain us, that he will renew us, he watches over us, that he loves us, that he will never reject us, that he will make everything right one day. So I invite us all, LVC, to take part in corporate prayer. And if you're not part of the LVC congregation, then please seek a church which values corporate prayer and whose corporate prayer is filled with adoration and the magnification of God. Those of us who have a strong private prayer life, which is vibrant, we need you in our corporate prayer meetings to lead us to adore God, to praise God, to sing to God, to confess our sins, to, to raise our petitions to Him. 
those of us who are struggling in their prayer lives, you need to participate in corporate prayer to be reminded once more of this sovereign God who loves you with a never-ending love. To be enamored by the God of your salvation once more. So if you are struggling to pray, or are unmotivated to pray, or have even ceased to pray, consider participating in corporate prayer to remind yourself of God's sovereignty, to remind yourself to rejoice in God's covenant faithfulness towards you and on you, and to be spurred once more to seek Him and to rejoice in Him. Therefore, I urge you, I urge all of us to prioritize corporate prayer for the health of our own personal prayer, life, prayer lives. Allow me to pray. God, I thank you that you reign. I thank you that you hold us. That men and women have testified that you, your name is a strong tower that we can run towards. That even though we go through the valley of the shadow of death, that you, if you are with us, we are fine. That better to fall upon you than to any other. That you are the God of loving kindness. That you are the, our Redeemer who went to the lengths of dying for us, who were enemies set against you by our lives, by our hearts. Yet you loved us while we were yet sinners. I thank you that you have not given up on us. I thank you that you don't put out those um, flints which are, have no fire anymore. Um, I thank you that you do not break the branches which are bent over. I thank you that you do not treat us as our sins deserve. I thank you that you alone are able to turn that which is intended for evil for good. I thank you that you know our tears and that you take note of them. I thank you that you are just and you will address all injustice. Either through the sacrifice of your son when one puts their faith on Jesus Christ or through judgment. I thank you that you are renewing all things that one day you will wipe away all tears and put to an end death and sin and the evil one. I thank you that you love us because you love us. So God, I pray for all who are struggling to pray. Help us pray. Help us gather as a church and lift up voices to you. Crying out, oh God, won't you save us? Won't you help our unbelief? Won't you renew our strength? Won't you, Lord, be glorified once more in us? So, God, I pray, may you be glorified today. In the words I have spoken, in the lives of those who have heard. In Jesus' name we do pray and believe. Um, before, we, before we leave, another aspect of... Uh, corporate prayer we've been doing as a church is uh, Pray 5. 
I don't know if you've been taking part in it. Um, we were supposed to pray for five people in our congregation. And we actually want to know how that has been going. So if you've been blessed by it, either as a recipient of prayer or you praying for other people, if um, you, had, you have specific examples of answered prayer or just encouragement by, of praying for other people, we really want to know about it. So I would urge you, please reach out and, and share your testimony either with an elder or one of the pastors or the staff mem or a staff member or a home group member um, so that all of us can be edified by your testimony. Uh, once more, have a great week and may the Lord be glorified in your life. Bye.